there was an inscription over him, This is the King of the Jews. In the name of the living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Public life is so enveloped, even at the present hour, by the dense fog of mutual hatreds and grievances, that it is almost impossible for the common people so much as freely to breathe. These words could have been written today, in 2022, but they weren't. Neither were these words. To these evils we must add the contests between political parties, many of which struggles do not originate in a real difference of opinion concerning the public good or in a laudable and disinterested search for what would best promote the common welfare, but in the desire for power and for the protection of some private interest which inevitably result in injury to the citizens as a whole. Neither were these words written in 2022, but they could have been. These political struggles also beget threats of popular action and at times eventuate in open rebellion and other disorders, which are all the more deplorable and harmful since they come from a public to whom it has been given in our modern democratic states to participate in very large measure in public life and in the affairs of government. Neither were these words written in 2022, but they could have been. In the face of our much praised progress, we behold with sorrow society lapsing back slowly but surely into a state of barbarism. All these words just read were published on December 23rd, 1922. 99 years and 11 months ago, almost to this day, they were written by Pope Pius XI in his first encyclical, Ubi Arcane Dei Concilio. The world was still recovering from the trauma of the Great War. The war was over, but there still was no peace on earth. The Pope pointed out the need for and the nature of true peace and its source, our Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote, First and most important of all for humanity is the need of spiritual peace. We do not need a peace that will consist merely in acts of external or formal courtesy, but a peace which will penetrate the souls of humanity and which will unite, heal, and reopen their hearts to that mutual affection which is born of brotherly love. The peace of Christ is the only peace answering this description, and the true peace of Christ can only exist in the kingdom of Christ. Three years later in December of 1925, Pope Pius continued building on this theme in his next encyclical, Quas Primas, and left an indelible imprint on the Western Church by adding a new feast to the liturgical calendar, the Feast of Christ the King. In this second encyclical, he writes, When once men recognize, both in private and in public life, that Christ is King, society will at last receive the great blessings of real liberty, well-ordered discipline, peace, and harmony. He went on to suggest that, celebrated at the end of the liturgical year, the Feast of the Kingship of Christ sets the crowning glory upon the mysteries of the life of Christ commemorated throughout the year. Make it your duty and your task, he charged the clergy, to see that sermons are preached to the people in every parish to teach them the meaning and the importance of this feast, that they may so order their lives as to be worthy of faithful and obedient subjects of the divine king. In Quas Primas, the Pope quotes St. Cyril of Alexandria and reveals the true nature of Christ as king. The foundation of this power and dignity of our Lord is rightly indicated by St. Cyril, who said, Christ has dominion over all creatures, 
a dominion not seized by violence nor usurped, but his by essence and by nature. The Pope goes on and says, that was St. Cyril. The Pope goes on and says, his kingship is founded upon the ineffable hypostatic union. From this it follows not only that Christ is to be adored by angels and men, but that to him as man, angels and men are subject and must recognize his power. Our Lord Jesus Christ is, and this is what he means by hypostatic union, he is at one and the same time a human being, born of the flesh of the Virgin Mary, and very God of very God, as St. Paul writes in his letter to the Colossians of our Lord. In him, in Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Christ is God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And so, by essence and nature, he is the King of kings and Lord of lords, having dominion over all. In the Orthodox tradition, there is a cross with three horizontal cross beams. The first one at the top is smaller, and it symbolizes the sign placed above our Lord's head. Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was meant to mock him, but instead reveals to the world the truth of our crucified King. St. Ambrose of Milan points out that this message is placed, he says, fittingly above the cross, because Christ's kingdom does not belong to his human body, but to his divine authority. Beaten, bruised, bleeding, broken, and suffering, lifted high above the earth for all the world to see, is the image of the invisible God. The very same of who St. Paul writes is the firstborn of all creation, in whom all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him, and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. What a wondrous mystery to behold. The crucified king reconciling to himself all things on earth and in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. It can only be either utter madness or amazingly true as St. Paul writes to the Corinthians of the crucified Christ, who is a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. A crucifix is an image of our Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross. It's found in many churches and homes and jewelry. But there are also images of Christ on the cross, fully vested in chasuble and stole in Eucharistic vestments such as these, priestly vestments on the cross, not dying, but reigning. This kind of cross with this juxtaposition of images is called the Christus Rex, Christ the King. It bears witness to our crucified King, his true identity as God made flesh, and the fulfillment of his work and completion of his reign through his death on the cross, resurrection from the dead, and ascension into the heavens. Christ is king. Of this there is no question. The only question is whether or not we acknowledge him as such. Do we mock him, goad him, demean him, selfishly challenge him like the thief on his left who said are you not the christ save yourself and us i dare you to do it or do we acknowledge our self sin our sinfulness and rebellion and brokenness like the thief on the right and confess as king of kings the crucified christ and submit our whole selves to his most gracious and loving reign. Jesus, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. Back to that Orthodox cross, the, the middle cross beam is, of course, for the arms of our Lord. And that third cross piece at the bottom is for his feet, but it carries with it a most powerful reminder and even challenge for us. This bottom cross beam is askew, it's slanted at an angle. And to the right, it points up, reminding us of the good thief. And to the left, it points down, reminding us of the impenitent thief. In this single simple image, this cross with its three cross beams reminds us that Jesus of Nazareth is the crucified King of Kings, and that there are only two choices for us to make in response to this revelation. Let us then confess Christ as King this day on this feast and every day. May he, in the words of Pope Pius XI, may he reign over our minds by his teachings, may he reign in our hearts by his love, and may he reign in our lives by living according to his law and the imitating of his example, so that the peace of Christ would reign in the kingdom of Christ for our salvation and for that of the world. In the name of the living and true God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.